Nehemiah 1 and verse number 1 into verse number 4. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Verse number 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When I heard, verse 4, and it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. We're going to look a little bit this evening in the book of Nehemiah and we're going to look at its beginning in a great portion, find a challenge for our lives there as to what it is that Nehemiah really was moved to do. Verse 2 says he asked concerning two places. But he did not just ask for curiosity's sake. God in his manifold wisdom would have placed that particular line of questioning in Nehemiah and to give Nehemiah what I call a burden. But a burden to do what? A burden to restore, I believe, honor and a burden for the people of God to have a perfect representation. This evening, that's what we're going to focus a little bit on. The matter of restoring honor and having a perfect representation. Let's pray and you'll be seated. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful indeed for the word of God. We're thankful for a church like this where the word of God could be opened. Lord, we can preach out of your precious word. We can be challenged. We could be encouraged. And moreover, dear Father, I'm so much in satisfaction that it's through your word you call men to your service you lead men into the work you set burdens in our heart you cause give us vision for tomorrow i pray in a special way O oh god that you will take the truth of your word tonight again and you will challenge your people as you alone can and father at the end of it we give you all the honor all the glory and all the praise because we ask it as a favor from you in jesus precious name amen you may be seated the man, Nehemiah, according to the scripture, is an outstanding Bible character. We know much about Nehemiah and Ezra, the book prior to him. And we sometimes just see him as a good leader. As a matter of fact, one gentleman said to me, the book of Nehemiah teaches everything about leadership. Now, I have no problems with finding leadership in the book. But I find in the book of Nehemiah something that goes beyond just a matter of de developing into becoming good leaders. I find in the book of Nehemiah something that I believe God kind of got a hold of my heart with. And that is what it is that really was driving this man, Nehemiah. It is without question that when you come to the end of the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's intention is not for so much of a personal benefit. Right. Nehemiah's intention when we come to the end and we look at everything was with the intention that the people of God and God most moreover would be honored in what he did. It is through that lens I'm watching the book of Nehemiah. 
that Nehemiah's intention is so that God's people and God's place could bring honor to God. Yeah. I want you to watch with me closely that Nehemiah is busy at work. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah's name means Jehovah comforts. God is able to give all comfort. Right, right. Now this Nehemiah here, according to verse 1, He's not in his hometown. Read with me verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chiselu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. Where is Nehemiah? Nehemiah is not at home. He's not in his hometown. Right. He's not among his home people, so to speak. He is in captivity. Right. He is working in the palace of the king while in captivity. At the end of chapter 1, it tells us what his occupation was. If you read at the end of chapter 1, he said, For I was the king's cupbearer. It means that Nehemiah was the one who would have tasted the king's food, tasted the king's wine, tasted the king's drink. You say, well, that's, that's a dangerous job. It might be, it is a dangerous job in the sense if anybody had a grievance with the king and wanted to poison the king, Nehemiah was the one who would have tested it. So anybody who had to die first would have been Nehemiah. But at the same time, it's an opportunity job in the sense that he's going to eat out of the king's food. He's going to drink out of the king's wine. He is right, so to, to speak, at a position where he's satisfied. Nehemiah is not in any difficulty, even if he is as in a strange land. Right. The Bible makes it clear that they are in that land because the, the, the nation, the, the nation of Israel, had turned their back on God. Right. They're, in, they're in captivity for a reason. What caused them to be in captivity? What caused the young man to, to end up in captivity? Not his choice, but his parents' behavior, yeah. his grandparents' behavior. His great-grandparents' behavior. His great-great-grandparents' behavior. You say, preacher, what was it? Here is what it is. When you read the book of Jeremiah, Nehemiah's grandparents and his great-grandparents turned their back on God. As a result, God allowed them to end up in captivity. And maybe I could inject something here for us this evening. As adults, what we do is going to affect the generation that we may, may, may never have seen. We would come to the end of our lives and what we would have done would have caused a generation that we may, maybe would never see end up somewhere we would never wanted them to end up. Right. And we've got to learn to make good choices as right. parents. Yeah. We've got to learn to make right choices as adults. Yeah. We've got to learn to be committed to God. Right. Your church has a number of young people and wonderful young people, capable young people. But the issue is going to be what we as adults do in our choice and decision that would affect them later on in their lives. Yeah. We're going to have to learn to make right decisions. Good. Nehemiah is in captivity. He's working while he's in captivity. The Bible tells me, however, in verse number 2, the text says that Hannah and I, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. I want you to notice that Nehemiah sees a group of, and I say young men, because I'm tempted to think Nehemiah is at a, 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 a still a pretty young age. Maybe not a teenager. I think he's past that. But he's as, as a young adult with a lot of capabilities. He sees, according to the text, his brethren coming to him. Some scholars believe that Hanani was his literal blood brother. Well, even if it wasn't his blood brother, he recognized him as his brother. Meaning, we come out of the same stock. Yeah. We belong to the same father. Right. We belong to the same group. Yeah. Here is what I'm driving at. Yeah. I'm saying that from time to time, we need to know who our brethren are. Yeah. Right. We need to know who's our brothers. We need to know why are they... Listen, he is my brother. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Our complexion is completely opposite. <laughs> but our inside is completely the same. And the truth is we come from the same father. God is my father. Jesus is my savior. If God is your father and Jesus is your savior, the color of my skin means nothing then. We are brethren. And here it is saying he saw his brethren. He identified them. He knew where they were. He knew where they came from. The text says that they come from 
the land of the captivity. Now, Nehemiah turns around and he has a conversation with them. He's going to speak with his brethren and this is what he asks a question. He asks, well, a two-part question. I want you to notice it in verse 2. Notice the question that he asks. The question is this. And he asks, and I ask them concerning what? The Jews, all right, that's one, that had escaped, which were left of the captivity. He's only telling you which group of Jews he's asking about. Then he's asking in the second part, and I ask them concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah asked a question. He asked the guys that were visiting, tell me, you're just coming from Jerusalem. You're, you're coming here to Shushan, you're coming where we are in captivity. And I just want you to give me quickly what's really happening back home. Yeah. How is it back at the house? How is everything doing back where you came from? I'm asking you concerning the Jews, and I'm asking you concerning Jerusalem. Well, I went into a little thought process and asked myself, why is it that he's asking concerning the Jews? And why is it that he's asking concerning Jerusalem? You see, God in his wisdom wanted Nehemiah to stay focused on two main areas, the people of God and the place of God. So he asked the question concerning the people of God. Now, who are the people of God? Clear cut, the Jews. And again, that fits where we are with the Jews going through the difficulty that they've been going through. I watched a little piece of news this evening. Um, I know while in America, I'm supposed to be careful where I listen to news, whether it's Fox News or CNN or whichever. <laughs> but I looked at a little piece of news this evening, and the Jews are in great difficulty. Right. And we got to continue praying because they are God's people. Right. The book, the Bible makes it clear, God has not forgotten his people. Right. God has not neglected his people. Right. The Jews would, react, would forever remain the apple of God's eye. The Bible tells me that they were not a people. They were not a part. God said, I didn't choose you because you were big and mighty and great. I choose you because of me choosing you. Right. Yeah. I choose you because I'm God. You are not a people. The Jews were not any particular highfalutin group. They were common people. But God in his wisdom chose them and made them his people. And he's gonna, he said, I'll, I'll make out of you a great nation. Right. The Jews remain God's people. That will not change, that has not changed, that cannot change. Right. Now when Nehemiah asks a question concerning the Jews, he is asking concerning God's people. He wants to know how, how is God's people doing that are back in the land of, of Israel, that are back in Jerusalem. I want to know how they're doing. Then he asks concerning the city where they are. Concerning Jerusalem itself, what's particular about Jerusalem? Jerusalem is God's city. So, I, I, well, I wouldn't ask that question. I know that you know that. That one of these days, King Jesus is going to rule out of where? Jerusalem. Right. Jerusalem remains God's capital city. Right. So when he asks concerning the people, and he asks concerning Jerusalem, he's asking concerning the things that are of particular interest to God. Right. Right. He wants to know how are they doing? Well, hear this. The people of God is supposed to be showing or having good representation of whom? God. The people of God is supposed to, the world is supposed to know these are the people of God. You're supposed to see it in them. Well, Jerusalem is the place that belongs to God and he wanted to know how is the place doing? I believe with all my heart, Pastor Foster, that when Nehemiah asked his brethren concerning the, the place and the people, he was expecting a very good report. Sure. Let me tell you why. The text tells me that they were left of the captivity. They were not taken in captivity. Right. They remained home while we were taken in captivity. And if anything, a, a, a place of blessing should have been those that are home yeah. that did not go into captivity. They remain in the land, they remain in safety, well I'd say in safety, but they remain at home. And Nehemiah expected them, those that were at home, to really and truly be given a great report. So he asked them, how is it? And to his amazement, he got an answer that he did not want. Right. Verse 3 tells me, verse 3 tells me, 
And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in what? Great affliction and what? These are the two conditions. That's at least two. And then he said the walls are broken down. He said the people are in a bad shape. They gave him an honest answer. Well, could I make a statement here? An honest question deserves an honest answer. And every once in a while, people need to ask honest questions. Underline that in your head. Honest questions. Everything that people ask you, they do not, you do not necessarily need to answer. Because there are people that may ask you stuff just to pry into your private affair and they've got no interest in any development. Everything that is asked doesn't always need an answer. But when people ask an honest, and that's what the, an honest question, then you need to give them an honest answer. When an honest question is asked and an honest answer is given, help is on the way. Let me go further and explain that. Let me go further and explain that. An honest question is this. And I listened to the young lady testifying a while ago. An honest question you could ask an individual is, have you given your life to Christ? Remember I mentioned this morning in Sunday school, the lady sitting next to me, she leaned over and asked me an honest question. The honest question was, Michael, have you given your life to Christ yet? That's all. And she was asking it out of genuine concern. Now, an honest question deserves an honest answer. If I ask you if you've given your life to Christ, and you know you have not given your life to Christ, and then you give me a lie, I really cannot help you. There is no help coming in your direction. Is you ask an individual, and I know the preacher, the, the church is really, and I, I, I feel very much um, touched by this. The church's drive to feed the homeless. We do not have as much homeless per se in our area, but we have people that are in great need. And so I'm, and I, I'm not asking you to do anything that's already in, on our pipeline at our church. For this coming up um, Christmas, we feed, we, we're doing packages food packages to give to several 20 or 25 homes. Give them enough that they could at least spend a, a good Christmas or, or bring them into the new year. Rice and the basic stuff. And I believe the church has a, a, has a, a responsibility to do that. But if you go to the homeless and you ask them an honest question and they give you a false answer, you really cannot help them. If you ask a person on drugs, are, do you, are you having, and I'm talking but from an honest heart, not from just prying into their lives. You ask them, listen, let me just ask you honestly, do you have a problem when it comes to substance intake? If they tell you, no, but you could see written all on their faces, you could see the needle mark all over their body, you know that they, don't, they are not really quite ready for help excepting you, you really convince them that your intention is to help. But when you ask an honest question and you get an honest answer, it means we are on our way to trying to, uh, to address a situation. Yeah, right. Nehemiah asked an honest question. What's the question? How are, is my brethren doing back at home? How are things in the house? How are, is the fa how are things back there? What does the city look like now? And the brethren gave him an honest answer. It's not what he wanted to hear, but it's what he needed to hear. Yes, right. Sometimes what we want to hear is to tittle our ears. Right. But that's not what we really need to hear. Right. We need to hear the things that are going to make us look at ourselves and make the core decisions that needs to be made so we could really launch forward and get our lives becoming active for God. Amen. An honest question. The honest answer is, the people are in bad shape. Yeah. Yeah. They are, according to verse 3, they are in great affliction. And they are a reproach. A reproach to whom? A reproach to themselves. And most so a reproach to God. When God looks at them, 
God is not having any pleasure in where they are. God is not, there is nothing about them that makes God feel great that they are his. They are still his. God did not throw them away. But they are, in a, they are in a condition that they're not supposed to be. Life is supposed to be giving a better image of God. Yeah, when Nehemiah heard that, he got broken on the inside. Yeah. Well, what about Jerusalem? Jerusalem is God's city. It is supposed to be representing God. And when Nehemiah hears what the condition of the, the city is, again, it doesn't paint a good picture of God. Let me just say this, folks. We are not the Jews. And the church is not Jerusalem. But these two entities, the, the Christian, and maybe I should make, let's turn to 1 Peter quickly. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll keep my eyes on the clock. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and watch, watch this with me quickly. 1 Peter in chapter number 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to read with me from verse number 8. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus. He said, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Verse number 9. But ye are a what? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Read verse number 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Peter said, listen, at one time you were not a people. But now... You are the people of God. Yes, yes. That's the church. That's the believer. Yes, the people of God is supposed to have a good representation of whom? If we are the people of God, we are supposed to be reflectors of God. In other words, the world is supposed to see God in us. I mean, the world is supposed to see us, and when they see us, they know by our action, by our speech, by our behavior, by our choices, we are children of the living God. Or else, God is not finding great pleasure in us. We are supposed to give a good representation of ourselves before God. I appreciate church. I love church. I love being in the house of God. I love God's people. But my real Christianity is not within the four walls of the church. My real Christianity is when I leave the church and I go to the outside where I work, where I play, the people that meet me on the job, in the, I mean, the people that I interact with. I want my light so shine before men. Why? That they may see my good work and glorify whom? My Father which is in heaven. I am supposed to be a good representation of God. Nehemiah, when he finds out where, what the state of the people are, they are in no position to bring honor to God. God is it's just a report. It's a shame to look at them. Then he said, what are the walls like? It's all broken down. Everything is in rubble, the text tells me. It, it is like a dump heap. Nobody is taking care of God's property. I'm going to have to drive this point home. I came in here this morning and I was just watching around. I just love it. You know why? Your church says a lot about you. Your church tells me a lot about how you, you, you reverence him who gives you the church. I look from your parking lot, your driveway. Your, there is just one thing I'm going to do when I come back. I'm going to change the driveway. I'm afraid I'm going to go down in this ditch. 
No, but it is just wonderful because you represent. Whom do you represent? I want to represent, that's right. I want us to represent him. And you got to bear this in mind. God is an awesome God. I mean, God is a God that is worthy of the very best. What we do for God is supposed to take priority. God is awesome in all his ways. Well, if I represent him, I want to represent him well. Nehemiah said, just tell me how they look. And the truth is, Brother Adrian, they just didn't look good. When Nehemiah heard that, it broke him. I believe from time to time, God is going to raise up Nehemiahs among us. Eh? From time to time, God is going to raise up young people. Are not necessarily young, but God is going to raise up men that has the energy to really make changes among us. I remember preach when I preached this down in Cayman Islands. I asked the question, look at your country. And I, I like to do this in America. Look at this country here. The land of the brave and of the free. I think that's how it is. Let me ask you, how is it now? How, how is it? How, in all honesty, how is it? If somebody was on the outside and they asked, you tell me, how is my wonderful America doing? Bearing in mind it was founded on God. It was founded on God's principle. And I'm not a historian. In high school, my weakest subject was history. And I couldn't, you wouldn't believe that. I was so weak in history that I was glad when I get to Form 4 to drop it. I, could, I, I would have never passed history for my um, exams. I just, I, man, I just couldn't remember history. But when I became a Christian and I got into God's word, I realized background information is so important, which becomes history. The little piece that I would have read here concerning America here and there, that this nation was the principle of the founding fathers was on God's word. The blessings and the growth, the prosperity. This is a wonderful place. Don't get me, it's beautiful. This is a wonderful place. But the, the issue is, in light of how God would look at it, how is it now? And it's got to be, that's, it, that's the word, in reproach. If resurrection, if the resurrection of the early fathers was just to happen and the, the men who were here in the earliest were just all raised to see this nation where it is now. I believe a lot of them would go to, to weeping. They'd sob. They'd look and say, it makes me feel as if I'd given my life in vain. How is it now? Every time things like that occur, it ought to challenge us as to what could we do about it. It gave Nehemiah in verse 4 a burden. Well, from the time Nehemiah got the report, <laughs> let's go back to Nehemiah. He was in the palace. Was he working? Talk to me. Was he eating? Was he eating well? Was he doing as, I mean, as far as an individual goes, was he doing well for him? Sure he was. But all of a sudden, a burden comes on his heart. He hears the condition of God's people and God's place, and a burden comes on him. Nehemiah is going to function from here onward with a burdened heart. A burden to do what? A burden to make a difference. A burden to change the dishonor and bring back honor where honor is due. Amen. A burden to fix up the place that represents God and fix it up to the best of his ability. Right. He is driven by a burden. Man, I, I found out based on what is a burden. A burden is a desire that leads us to a purpose. And I'm going to give you some of those quickly. What's a burden? And I like that second one. 
One man said, a burden is an impregnation of divine agitation. <laughs> You're full of something that just moves inside of you. You've got to get it out. A burden, he says, a third man said, is a grief that arrests our heart and our spirit. A burden is like a seed of great possibilities. A burden is a weight of a deeper call. A burden is a summon to a greater clarity and purpose. A burden is snatching from comfort to commission. Nehemiah got a burden. When you go to chapter 2, Nehemiah said, God gave him the burden. So how did God give him the burden? God allowed the burden to come on him by him hearing of the situation and him getting a picture in his mind as to what the situation is and to realize, I am sitting here in comfort. I am feeding here in comfort. But the people, the place, I can ignore it if I want to, but I cannot ignore it. Because the people of God the place that represents God. I, I wish I could do something. So what he did, he did something. Yeah. The burden changed his course of direction. Sure. It changed his behavior. Yeah. It changed his dream. Yeah. It changed his demeanor. The burden just changed the man himself. What did he do? The verse 4 tells me what he did. Verse 4 of Nehemiah, go back to the verse 4 of Nehemiah quickly. And you'll notice when he heard that, he, he says, And it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He said, when I heard that, I just got to fall in, out into prayer. I am so thankful that there, we serve a God who answers prayer. Amen. And folks, listen to me. We need to keep our, our, our prayer spirit going. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to pray for this country. We need to pray for our church, like I mentioned this morning. We need to just spend time talking to God about the situations. Three months, Nehemiah is praying. Chapter 1 and verse 1 says it was in the month Chislu. But in chapter 2 and verse 1, it tells us it's in a different month. And based on the Jewish calendar, when you look at it, it's three months. For three months... This thing is burning in the heart of Nehemiah. Nehemiah cannot shake it. He cannot get it loose. He wants to do something. He wants to bring back honor to God. He wants to bring back honor among God's people. He wants to see a church, so to speak, that is on fire for God. That's one of the things I like about this preacher. You know. The first time I heard him preach, I said to myself, my soul, I wonder if you can preach one whole week. <laughs> and I realized one whole week is a joke. He can preach and preach because there is something that drives him. What does he want? He wants to see God's people rise to the occasion that we bring honor and glory to God. Folks, listen, that's part of my preaching passion that the people of God, the church where I am, the young people and the older people, the folks at the church would rise to the occasion. Let's bring great honor to God. Amen. And Nehemiah goes to pray. Amen. Three months he's praying. In chapter 2 and verse 1, the burden is still on him. He goes back to work, but it affected his work. Yeah. Read chapter 2 verse 1 quickly. We're we going we to shut it down in a minute. Look into chapter 2 verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before the king. What is his job? He's the king cup's bearer. Cup bearer, he's going to have to bring that first drink. Before the king drinks, he's going to taste it, make sure it's all right. If when he tastes it, if when he tastes the wine, he went, ah. Oh. The king would say, that's good wine. But if when he tastes the wine, he frowned. Yeah. Well, watch this. The text tells us, read it again, that wine was before the king. And I took up, and I took up the, the wine and gave it unto the king. Read the next sentence. Now I had not been before time, what? Sad in his presence. What's making him sad? He's got a burden. He's got something weighing down on his inside. God, let me not say he's got a burden. God gave him a burden. 
God placed a weight on the inside, something he cannot shake because there is honor that needs to be restored to the people and to the place of God. He goes before the king, but he's got God's calling on him. And the Bible said he goes before the king and his face is sad. Three months. He said, I've never been in the king's presence sad before. All my life I worked in that place, but I, and I've always been the jolly, happy man that the king is just happy to see. But today he's watching my face with a great difference. Yeah. And the text tells me, and the king said, verse 2, when the king said, wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seen, you're not sick. Wait a minute. The king wasn't sick. Because he was good for the last couple of months. So why, why is your face so sad? Notice what the king finally said. He said, this is nothing else but what? Sorrow of heart. He said, then I was sore, very afraid. He said, hold on a minute. This is Nehemiah. He goes before the king. Face sad. And the king said, why, oh, What's up? Tell me why you're sad. Do you have a problem with me? The question is underneath. In the sense that if he is sad in the king's presence and he has a grievance with the, with, with the king, a sad countenance in the king's presence could mean having a grievance with the king. Remember, he's the king what? Cabrera. He has to drink before the king drinks. If he has a grievance with the king, if he has a, 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 a situation with the king, it is easy for him being the king cupbearer to poison the king. If, if he comes sad, the king would, would, would interpret it, you have a problem with me. You have a problem with me. If you have a problem with me, then you cannot work in that particular position. As a matter of fact, his life was on the, on the line. Yeah. If, he's a, if he's had a grievance with the king, working right up as the king's cupbearer, and you have a grievance with the king, the king is going to get rid of you. Right. Right. And the king said, you know what's wrong with you? You've got sorrow of heart. Yeah. Anybody here have, ever had sorrow of heart? Yeah. I mentioned that while I was down in Cayman. I'd mention it again. I got saved in 1980. When I got saved in 1980, as a teenager, I didn't come from a Christian family. I told you all this morning, I came from Catholic. I came from Catholicism. That's one side of it. I came from socialism. That's the next side of it. But I came from a family with wild living. My father has 21 children. He's got five children with my mother, which is his wife. And he has 16 children in the communities around. That's what I grew up seeing. That's what I grew up with. That's what I grew up thinking that that's really life. By the time I was 17, preacher, in my head, that's how a boy lives. A boy lives with as many girlfriends as possible. I'm playing sports. I'm playing music. I'm running track. And like anywhere else, girls are attracted, not any negative thing, but it attracts. When I got saved, I dropped some of the girls and I kept one. I kept one. I kept one that I thought, she's going to be my wife. I'm going to stick with that one. Listen, we are not going to do the stuff we did before. I'm a Christian. I don't go into the I went to the dance hall once after and I didn't stay. I grew up as a dancer. My parents would have won several trophies for dancing. From the time this leg could have balanced itself, I've been dancing. So she wanted to, for us to go to a home dance and I went. But man, the Holy Ghost of God is awesome. The same music that I used to dance to Brother Adrian. Man, I don't feel it. I just don't want to. So I stood up. <laughs> I stood up in a corner. And she's wondering, what's wrong with you? 
Well, I don't feel, I'm not feeling good here. I just don't feel. Then she said, you know what? I think you want to go home? And I said, yeah, I want to go home. Well, I spoiled her night. But at the same time, I couldn't, I just couldn't. I went home. I am trying to make her live as a, sorry for pointing you, darling, but I'm trying to make her live as a Christian. But she's not no Christian. She's wondering what's wrong with me. But I, in my heart, I thought I still loved her. Dumb. <laughs> Dumb. God always wants to protect us through his word. Young people, listen to me. When God said, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, God doesn't want to spite you. God wants to secure you. He wants to save you from heartbreaks. He wants to save you from a life of... But I didn't know that, bro. I kept her. Well, I tell you what. One Sunday afternoon, decide before I go to church, I'm going to go to her home, sit there with her grandparents and, you know, sit with them a little bit. And when it's quarter to six, I'd head off and go up to church. Well, I'm walking, go up to her house. To her, I'm walking, go to her home. <laughs> and she had a lot of hair. She was Indian, a lot of hair. And I, to, to me, I just took a glance as if to see a bunch of hair disappear behind a dashboard. I went up to the house. When I got there, the grandmother started talking to me. It was her. My heart broke. I have right now sorrow of heart. To this day, I could tell you the car number. I could tell you the model of the car she passed in. I mean, he just did some. So when I go to church tonight, I went to church tonight, every Sunday night service, and every song that they sang, I'm crying. Every song made me weep. And maybe the preacher is saying, man, he's so spiritual. <laughs> Sorrow of heart, broken hearted. But God had to use that to teach me, follow his will. 15 years later, no, a little more than 15, I got a phone call. She's living here in the States now. Married to, got married to a pilot and the same gentleman. And I got a phone call. And I had to keep her name out of due respect. And she said, this is, and she mentioned the name. Well, I didn't hear that name for 15, 20 years or more. She said, I, I searched for your number and found your number because I want to tell you, listen to this. I just gave my life to Christ. <laughs> She's now living a Christian life in Maryland. But sorrow of heart could make you do strange things. Yeah, sure. Nehemiah, the king said, you have sorrow of heart. Something, something affected your heart. <laughs> and Nehemiah said in verse 3, O king, live forever. There is nothing between me and you. I still want you to remain king. But why shouldn't I have my heart been sorrowful? And he gives him in chapter 2 how his father's house and his, the sepulchre. Everything is broken down. My whole history is in a mess. Everything is just not where it's supposed to. And the king said, well, I'm, I'm about closing. What do you want me to do? He said, I want your permission to go back and fix it. Okay, let me just ask this. What is Nehemiah's job? What is it that he wants to take on here now? Project manager. A burden could make you do stuff that you don't think you could do. Because of the burden in his heart, and he, as he said, God said that burden in my heart. He said, now I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to go back and do something about it. Yeah. If you're not driven by a burden, you, you will leave what you do very easily. Yeah. Yeah. But when God places a burden in your heart, yeah. not even the enemy could stop you because there is something driving you more than just this. Yeah. You see, when you finish the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah had enemies in chapter 2, starting with 2, going to 3, going to a whole massive group, having a whole, but nothing stopped him. Why? He was still driven by the burden on the inside to bring back honor to God and to God's people. Right. Driven by that. 
in the day in which we live. I believe God is looking for a bunch of people with a heart that is going to say this. God, in the neck of the woods where you place me, in the place where you place me, I'm going to strive to bring honor and to help the people of God to bring honor to you and the place that you have given us, I'm going to make it the best we could make it so that it would bring honor to you. God is still looking for one man he admires. I don't have time to go to chapter 3 and to show you how he got his workers. Because he got his workers from right among the people. You know. They were all there. They just lacked motivation. They lacked leadership. They lacked somebody to show them that it could be done. He didn't have to import labor. They were right there. The people got up and it's amazing in chapter 3. Who got up to work? Blacksmith got up to work. Goldsmith got up to work. Perfume makers got up to work. Listen, a man who did not have sons took his precious daughters. Chapter 3, yeah. verse 12. And I, say, I like to say this. For, for whatever the length of period was, if it's a 52 days, he said to these girls, we're going to fix, we're going to fix that gate. We're going to fix our section. Yeah. So daddy and girls, yeah. no nail polish. Know how you call on top pedicure? Yeah, <laughs> Everything dropped for a while until we finished the work God gave us to finish. Right. Amen. Nehemiah got the work done in, in 52 days. Everything going against him. And that was one level. He finished the structure, secured them on the inside. And then he worked with them on the inside as to the various problems they have. Problems in chapter 5. Brethren are not in harmony. So he's going to fix that. They beat, they're stealing from one another. He fixed that. But at least there is one thing that drives him. At the end of it, he wants the whole group that God could take pleasure in who they are. Yeah. And I'm saying this and I'm done this evening. Let's desire to bring honor back to God. Amen, Amen folks. Amen. Whatever, whatever we need to do. Let's have a passion in our heart. Oh God, give me a burden. Yeah. Lord, give me a burden. Lord, lay, lay a burden on my heart. A burden to accomplish something here while I live. Yeah. Right. Yeah. God, please, and let that burden stay in me until I would have accomplished what you wanted me to accomplish. Yeah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to bring honor to God. Amen. Honor from my life. Honor from my living, honor from my choice, honor from my giving. Oh God, I want you to give me a burden. I want you to set a burden on my heart. A burden that I'll do more than I've ever done, more than I think I could have done. I'd, I would, listen, pick up a job that maybe I was never trained to do. But for your glory, God, I just want to bring honor back to you. If you're here tonight, I'm going to ask you an honest question. Have you given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope the answer is a true, quest, a true answer. Okay, if you have given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, have you committed your entire self to him that God could take you from anything you're doing? I mean, anything you're doing, God could get a, the better of you and you would do it for God, even if he doesn't bring you the end that you want to bring. God, I surrender my life to you. Are you surrendered to him? Father, I've done what you've laid on my heart for the moment. I'm asking you to take control. Minister to your people. These are your people. God, my heart knits with them. That Father, we want to do the best we can while we walk the face of the earth to honor you, to bring honor to you who you are, and to help others to honor, to restore honor and proper representation to you. Take control. Be with the man of God, we pray in Jesus' name. But first, 
Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.